So I want to welcome you all to this panel that we're having. My name is Steve Zeltzer. I'm with the Labor Education Project on AFL-CIO International Operations. And also I'm a member of the Pacific Media Workers Guild here in San Francisco. And the Produce Work Week, uh, a program on KPO in San Francisco, as well as Capitalism, Race, and Democracy on Pacifica. And I'm happy we're having this meeting. And I've been involved for decades, actually, around the issue of Zionism and, and the labor movement and the, the role of the AFL-CIO and other unions. So I think this is uh, a, an important panel. And actually, for the first time in, in, uh, in really history, there are thousands and thousands of trade unions throughout the country that are mobilizing uh, around the issue of Palestine and beginning to seriously look at uh, Zionism and, and the history of Zionism and the relationship of Zionism to the AFL-CIO. LaPaio, or, and you'll see why, why we call it that, is the Labor Education Project on AFL-CIO uh, International Operations. We are a group of trade unions from across the United States that uh, from a number from a number of unions uh, they came together to challenge the AFL-CIO's foreign policy um, and um, and try to build support for raising these questions within the within the labor movement. Well, the basis of our work has been uh, to try to do particularly educational events. We have had them. We have had them in Philadelphia in 2022 outside the AFL uh, National Convention. We had another one in Washington last year uh, in on September uh, 10th, which was the day before the 50th anniversary of the coup in Chile, where we worked with some Chilean trade unions. So what we're trying to do is make people aware and start asking questions about what the AFL-CIO is doing, et cetera. So we have, we've been together for about a year and a half and it's, uh, and it's a group of people that have, that have come to work together fairly well. So I think, uh, like to in, invite any of you that want to, uh, want to get involved, uh, to, to contact us, um, after this meeting or whatever. And we look forward to a, to a lively panel. So there you go, Steve. Thanks, Kim, and appreciate that. We have a number of speakers. They're going to speak from 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion, comments. She is a member of UAW 2325 in New York City. Uh, her union represents legal aid uh, workers, uh, society workers, and um, she also produces uh, two programs at WBA. BIA. She's a longtime producer and uh, has been active in and raising these issues uh, in her union and also for people on on the air. So welcome, Mimi. So you know. good to be here with my very esteemed uh, colleagues and forgive my uh, technological prowess is somewhat uh, lacking in this instance. Uh, and I do want to just begin to by saying, you know, today, ironically, in many ways, is uh, International Holocaust Recognition Day. And in that context, while I certainly mourn the 15 to 20 million people, the Jews, the Russians, the Roma, the disabled, the gays who, who died and others at the hands of National Socialism, the Nazis, I must remind <laughs> that the Holocaust of Southwest Africa, of Namibia, and certainly the ongoing American Indian rolling Holocaust, as is that of the Palestinians, is largely absent from the recognition, uh, which has such great importance and shows me the significance of the work that we are trying to do relevant to the working class. And in fact, we must understand that today, as Professor Norman Finkelstein related, the Israelis have turned the Holocaust into an industry in which they have weaponized and mercilessly exploit the memory of it to build support for their messianic Zionist colonial project. And it's genocide of Gazans and rapidly, which is expanding to the occupied West Bank. And I must add that while I applaud South Africa for helping to globalize the intifada, if you will, and bringing and raising the genocide conventions 
before the IJC, both as a lawyer and political person. Certainly it couldn't have happened a year ago and that's progress and that's important and it's important to the Palestinians. But it is in this context that I react to and condemn the cowardice of the IJC for its refusal to issue an emergency declaration of irreparable harm, a finding of genocide, and in effect to give Israel 30 days to ramp up further its propaganda machine, such as APAC, and which has paid millions to U.S. politicians such as Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries and Richie Rivera and others to both lie about its motivation for the brutal onslaught in Gaza, and which, I contend, is both to empty Gaza and to raise Gaza, to raise Gaza to the ground, which has little to do, of course, with the issues of security or even the perversions of Messianic Zionist identity. But it is as much about the socioeconomic projects of the Zionist colonial enterprise, which are wrapped up with the natural gas, the oil exploitation, among other economic factors of the area. And I mention this because as we continue to mobilize, to educate and agitate and organize within the labor sphere, we have to have a broader context and understanding of what is happening. And there is a genocide, but there is a genocide that both seeks to empty Gaza of its people, but then as well, and I think the October 7th events were pretextual to raise it to the ground for its very socioeconomic projects, which are part of always the colonialist enterprise. And with that, I have to mention that, which also has to be incorporated in, uh, we have to go beyond the idea of ceased fire and educate as to what it's about and frankly the day after as well and with that we have to understand that the u.s with its hegemonistic aspirations over china's silk road if you will presence and the advance of western asia in the area and again by the raising of gaza finally to allow the long favored project i.e. the 1960s conceived of Ben-Gurion Canal through Gaza. Gaza, after all, which is five miles wide and 26 miles long. And if you build this canal, which is well in progress now, which is an aspiration of the U.S. and so on, for what reason? Well, obvious to completely circumvent and raise as obsolete the Suez Canal. I'm just concerned that what hasn't been built into many of the, the protests and the understanding and the resolutions are the socioeconomic factors, um, which we're not going to get deeply into, but I do want to raise that as part of what I think labor has to consider as we uh, continue our organizing process and resolutions. So the issue of building the Ben-Gurion Canal, which has everything to do with not only emptying the population, but raising and helps us understand why the bombardment and so on. They're raising the entire infrastructure and making it unlivable and making it easy target for the building of uh, a canal. So these are some of the 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 context in which uh, I'm I'm trying to inform my thoughts and remarks. And I want to say two other broader things about labor uh, as we continue to look at the responsibilities and so on, and what has happened with labor historically, the AFL and so on. That I think as a movement, and I certainly hope that these issues can be taken up at the Labor Notes Conference and in other venues, that the depoliticization of the labor movement and its complete failing to deal with the politics of the human condition and the social society in which we live to make it nothing more than an economist vehicle 
has been a terrible blow to the working class. And as labor activists, it's imperative for us, even though that's not the major topic now, to begin to think about how to repoliticize and understand that the functions of the union are as a unit for the assumption of working class power and ultimately the governance by the people for the people rather than merely the improvement of some limited number of uh, economic aspects of our lives. The other thing I want to say, which takes me to where uh, even unions like the UAW are now and so on, and the Teamsters, uh, which is desperately concerning, we still haven't managed to really democratize our unions. So regardless of what your position might be relevant to Sean Fain's automatic and this is our new grand leadership. And indeed it is in many ways. And it was admirable in its stand-up strike strategy. But as to the democratization of the union and the union membership having a role in what its political position is, as it automatically and summarily came out in support of Biden without any critique whatsoever or extraction of any gains for the working class and certainly for the Palestinians is just horrific. And now we know that we're on the precipice similarly of another union with a, <laughs> a reinvented, if you will, leadership, O'Brien, who is very, is was meeting secretly with the, the uh, Biden ad administration and also uh, it would appear willing to give the votes of the membership, the union, without any concessions, without any discourse for the union. So we still have a major issue about, uh, in order to gain ground around Gaza or any other issue, the democratization of our unions. But having said that, I do want to go back to what perhaps certainly the people on this panel already know, which is looking at uh, the very issues of what the AFL-CIO role has been historically, the top labor federation in, and what we should concern ourselves about that. And I do want to remind people that there really was a time when uh, organizations, which I work for, I was the director of organizing of the uh, ILGWU's uh, South Bronx office at one point. My mother was a garment worker there. And the uh, at that point, uh, largely Jewish makeup of the union was absolutely antithetical to the Zionist project. It was antithetical and it come from a very different place in the politics uh, of Europe, certainly. Uh, but as as the you know, it was really uh, and so was the amalgamated clothing workers, both of their political teeth really cut in Eastern Europe as members of the Socialist Jewish Labor Bund. So the issue of how these organizations transformed politically, we certainly don't have all that much time to get into, but I do want to make mention that really it was largely after the European Jews began to move to Palestine that they began to uh, really, the AFL-CIO, close their relationship with the Histadruth, the Labor Zionist Federation in Palestine. It functioned both as a labor federation and a network of cooperatives and industrial enterprises and housing companies and so on. So the Histadrut, unlike many of our unions, is a fundamental part of the state apparatus. And more and more and more, the labor federations began to feed into and support them. And indeed, the Histadrut received millions and millions of dollars in donation from the U.S. unions from the uh, 20s to the 40s. Uh, there were leaders such as uh, Golda Meir and, of course, Ben Gurion, who counted on U.S. labor officials amongst reliable foreign allies uh, and got just untold amounts of money. And by the end of World War II, there were the unionists in my what was my union at that juncture in which I worked for the ILGWU. President David Dubinsky began to advocate. Uh, for the petitioning of Palestine and the creation of the state of Israel, 
without, of course, any regard for the Palestinians. So there's a long history between certainly the Histadrut and the uh, AFL-CIO. Um, I know that my time should be limited here and there's so much more that other peoples have to uh, contribute here, but I, I do want to kind of skip to the uh, to the part really where as the AFL-CIO became more immersed in support for uh, the Vietnam War and various other imperialist colonialist uh, endeavors, uh, the role of the workers, the role of the workers really became formidable. Uh, for example, after the October War of 1973, to try and regain the territory they'd lost six years earlier, there was Detroit's huge community of Arab auto workers that was shocked to discover that their union, my union now, the UAW, had held $785,000 in Israeli bonds on October, $780,000 roughly in bonds. So on October 13th, around 3,000 protesters, largely of Arab ancestry, marched in Dearborn to the UAW local office, demanding the bonds be liquefied, liquidated, excuse me. And soon after, they formed an Arab Workers Caucus, forging an alliance with their fellow UAW dissonance Hello. from the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Hello. Uh, I, Hello? Um, fine. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Steve, you should kind of give me a, a heads up as oh, okay. to time. Be, but okay, what yeah, I... The time, yeah, the time is up, actually. I sent you... Oh, a, then yeah. what I want to say is that uh, essentially uh, it is imperative that we work to democratize our unions that still the struggle and that we work to give the working class a better sense in the society that our unions have to become political deals, vehicles. And that way we begin to take up these issues and that the resolutions, a few that have been passed by the UAW now, by the postal workers, uh, are not enough, that they have to press more aggressively and we can look to groups like the Detroit Revolutionary Auto Workers and others that we have to press much more concertedly uh, around the fundamental issues that are driving this genocide, which are both uh, identity based in terms of the efforts to Judaicize all of uh, the landmark landmass that is the third parallel. Palestine from the river to the sea and the socioeconomic endeavors of the colonialist projects and certainly the imperialist hegemonist interest of the United States. And I can certainly talk at some appropriate point about what I think those demands have to be. But yes, I do applaud the fact that um, colleagues are beginning to organize and see themselves as part of internationalizing the intifada, which absolutely is a necessity for there to be any substantive change in the uh, condition and circumstances of this uh, unfolding genocide in what I contend must be looked at by the labor movement. And I will end with this, which is the day after, which is the issue of self-determination for the Palestinian people. Because if the effort that is put forth is to return to Oslo, essentially. It will be the continuation of an apartheid uh, regime. And we will have been no assistance to really supporting uh, what is imperative, which is a free, free Palestine from the river to the sea uh, with the self-determination and determination of the uh, Palestinians, and which I hope is for a Uni state okay. with the right to return and certainly equal rights and justice for all. Thank you, Mimi, uh, for that report. Um, our next speaker is Jeff Shirky. He's a professor at the Harry Van Arsdale uh, School of Labor Studies at uh, SUNY and uh, the Empire, uh, Empire State System. And he uh, has been writing many articles and doing research 
on the history of the histid route and also developments in the AFL-CIO, where for the first time there's actually a debate in the AFL-CIO leadership, executive council, around the question of Zionism, which I think has never happened before. So welcome, Jeff, to our uh, panel today. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a lot of what I was going to say about the history of uh, U.S. labor and, and uh, Zionism, Mimi kind of covered it a little bit. Um, and I think drawing from one of my articles, it seems like sounded mm -hmm. like. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I thought that sounds familiar. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the support from U.S. labor officialdom for Zionism goes back at least to 1917, when uh, at the AFL's national convention that year, that November, the delegates voted on a platform. This was right as the U.S. was entering World War I. So it was kind of this pro-war, we support President Wilson and the war effort kind of platform. And one of the planks of that was supporting the establishment of a national uh, national homeland for Jews in Palestine. And it carried particular weight because this was only a couple of weeks. This was November 1917, just a couple of weeks after the Balfour Declaration, which was, you know, the British policy of supporting Zionist settlement and colonization of Palestine. And um, the Histadrut was founded uh, in Palestine in 1920 um, by uh, uh, labor Zionists, basically socialists who were tr trying to, um, well, they, their, their argument, this was it started with a group called Poale Zion, which was uh, Workers of Zion, um, a group that was trying to bridge the divide between socialists from the Jewish labor bund in Eastern Europe and Zionists. And their, their argument was that the reason for economic exploitation for Jews was that they didn't have a national homeland. So in any case, their, their plan was to um, uh, settle and colonize Palestine by building up their own like Jewish only economy, um, creating collective farms, kibbutz, um, and uh, different types of workplaces, industrial enterprises, banks, hospitals, um, that would be, be uh, that would exclude the indigenous Palestinian Arab population and basically create a whole economy in order to create a, a Jewish working class in Palestine and to absorb uh, Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe. And as Mimi mentioned, a lot of the Jewish American labor leaders in this time, uh, with the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, people like David Dubinsky and Sidney Hillman, they got their start in politics back in Eastern Europe when they were younger, as members of the Jewish Labor Bund um, that were, you know, anti-Zionist or at least non-Zionist. Um, but as the Histadrut started, as once the Histadrut was created in 1920, and as it um, started building, they, people like Dubinsky in particular, um, started sympathizing with uh, the, these like just Jewish working class that was developing in Palestine and wanting to provide material support for them. And interestingly, they still, people like Dubinsky and these other Jewish American labor leaders, they still identified themselves as non-Zionists. They said, we don't really support that idea because they saw it as kind of utopian and just against their, uh, their own uh, political ideology. But nevertheless, as a matter of like practical solidarity, they wanted to support Histadru. Um, and so, there would be these big fundraiser campaigns across the U.S. Um, with different union locals um, throughout the 1920s that raised millions of dollars for Histadrut to do this, to, to all, all this work I mentioned, creating um, all these different types of inst economic institutions in, in Palestine. And then jumping ahead a little bit to um, the period after, after the Holocaust, immediately after, um, and there was increasing arguments for um, the creation of the State of Israel, um, in part because of the Holocaust, because uh, the British were ready to, to leave Palestine. And um, in 1948, when the State of Israel was established, um, and obviously there was the, the Nekba, 
the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous Palestinian population, and then the neighboring Arab states invaded, and it was a uh, you know this big huge war going on with the Palestinian Arabs being you know uh, expelled, seven hundred fifty thousand refugees. Um, in this crucial moment, U.S. labor leaders, and not just Jewish labor leaders, but you know people like William Green, the president of the AFL, and Philip Murray, president of the CIO, were lobbying President Truman to immediately recognize the state of Israel, and they were lobbying him to send weapons to the Zionist militias that were actually carrying out the, the ethnic cleansing. Um, in April of 1948, the different garment worker unions in New York City actually staged a half day uh, general strike. Something like 30,000 garment worker unions in New York City quit work a few hours early. Uh, I think it was April 15th of 1948 and then had this big rally at Yankee Stadium where they were calling on Truman to recognize the state of Israel once it was declared, which you know happened one month later and saying send weapons to the Zionist militias. Um, and that's part, this was an election year for Truman, you know, famously very close election year for him. And this was part of what entered his decision-making when he did immediately recognize the state of Israel. Although he didn't, he didn't send weapons right away, but then within a couple of years, um, like again, there's another example in 1950 where both AFL president William Green and CIO president Philip Murray together visited the White House um, specifically to pressure Truman to send economic aid um, and military aid to Israel. And it was a very rare thing for the presidents of the AFL and CIO to both, uh, at least at that time, to both visit uh, the White House together. And it was in order to uh, lobby on behalf of Israel. And a lot of the talking points that they got uh, when they would do this kind of political lobbying came from like the Israeli ambassador and Israeli diplomats. So in a sense, U.S. labor leaders were acting as like foreign agents, you know, agents on behalf of a foreign government and lobbying the U.S. government. Um, you know, throughout the first several decades of Israel's existence, it was repeatedly at war with, with Jordan, with Egypt, with uh, Syria, Lebanon on multiple occasions. And every time that happened, um, U.S. labor leaders would issue these very strong statements saying, you know, we stand with Israel, we call on the U.S. government to give full backing to Israel. You know, it wasn't really until after the 1967 war that the U.S. became what it is now, which is, you know, Israel's number one champion in the whole world. But those first 20 years or so of Israel's existence, there were many examples of the U.S. government criticizing Israel, trying to you know, restrain some of Israel's actions. And when that happened, U.S. labor leaders would kind of jump in and start pressuring the U.S. government to uh, uh, to take a different stance, to be more you know favorable to Israel. Um, there were also, whenever Israel was at war, in addition to the statements coming from labor leaders, uh, there would be, you know, pro-Israel rallies and marches and fundraisers for Histadrut, fundraisers for the Israeli government. Um, so, and I, and I say that just to point out that, you know, right now, as there's some, you know, uh, some action and some activity by unions um, that are calling for a ceasefire or expressing sympathy for the Palestinians, and a lot of people say, why are unions weighing in on this at all? What has this got to do with them? They've been weighing in all along for decades and decades, but it was always completely on the side of Israel. And it's only when they start to, you know, just express a minor amount of sympathy towards the Palestinians that it suddenly becomes controversial and everyone's asking, why are they doing this? Um, uh, another important aspect of U.S. labor support for Israel has been the state of Israel bonds that I'm sure most of you know about. That this was a program that started in 1951, only you know a few years after Israel's founding, um, all over the world, but especially in the United States, to um, allow different institutional investors to put money directly into the Israeli state for infrastructure projects, and um, the Israeli government in its first few decades was 
you know, people who had come out of the history with these labor Zionists, these labor Zionist parties, people like Ben Gurion or uh, Golda Meir, and they understood that they could get U.S. unions to uh, make these contributions to purchase these um, bonds that would go into Israeli infrastructure programs like I Israeli um, irrigation programs, the National Water Carrier, which uh, in the 1950s and 60s was especially controversial because it was um, uh, redirecting water from the fresh water from the Jordan River away from uh, Jordan and Syria. But the, the, a lot of the money for that came from these bond purchases and U.S. unions were purchasing hundreds of millions of dollars of these bonds and having you know, these big fundraiser events, these big testimonial dinners for labor leaders um, to, to do these fundraisers to buy the bonds. The exact number, uh, the exact amount of money is a little unclear because especially ever since the BDS movement started 20 years ago, it's been there's been kind of a deliberate attempt to, to conceal how much uh, money unions have invested in these bonds. But uh, some documents I found from 1994 from the Development Corporation for Israel, which is the, the actual agency in the U.S. that sells the bonds, said that U.S. labor, that like unions at the local level, regional state, national level, all, all combined, had purchased $1 billion worth of bonds from between 1951 and 1994. And then in 2002, there was an article in the foreword where an official from um, the, I think from the Development Corporation for Israel, just kind of mentioned offhand that U.S. labor had purchased $5 billion worth of bonds. So what, what the real number is, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's clearly a lot. And that's money going, again, directly into the Israeli state coming from union dues from pension funds, strike funds, et cetera. Um, and then another aspect of beyond the bonds, other donations, you know, more direct for direct specific projects, especially in the 1950s and 60s for public facilities, for union halls in Israel and community centers, hospitals, schools, sports stadiums, uh, all kinds of public facilities like that got lots of donations from different unions. And in return for that, the, a lot of these buildings um, were named after U.S. labor leaders. Um, people, you know, people like Ruther, George Meany, uh, Philip Murray, William Green, Jimmy Hoffa. They have, they, at least in the 50s and 60s, they had all these different kinds of facilities named with their names on it there in Israel. Just again, um, showing that kind of level of connection. Um, and another example I, <clears throat> I like to point out of the support this, during the 1982 Israel's invasion of Lebanon, and siege of Beirut, which was received international condemnation. At the height of that, at the height of the siege of Beirut, the AFL-CIO executive council went to the trouble of putting out a full page ad in the New York Times with a statement in all caps saying the AFL-CIO is not neutral. We support Israel. Um, so again, when people today say, why are labor, why are unions weighing in? You know, it's just so disingenuous in my opinion, when you look at the history. Um, I feel like I'm rambling on and on here. I'm just trying to think of various examples. Um, since the 19, oh, one other thing, Lane Kirkland, who became AFL-CIO president in 1979, who was, um, his wife was from, well, her, his wife had lived in Israel. She was originally from Poland, I believe, but then spent some time in Israel and then came to the U.S. Uh, he was very, not just pro-Israel, but you could say truly anti-Palestinian. And in like the early 80s, especially, he was um, forcefully trying to pressure first the Carter administration and the Reagan administration to never recognize a Palestinian state and saying any Palestinian state would be a terrorist state and things like this, really just going out of his way uh, to, uh, to denounce the whole Palestinian movement for self-determination. Um, but since the 90s with the Oslo Accords um, and then the, you know, 
the change in labor leadership in the AFL-CIO with John Sweeney and the new voice uh, slate, there was kind of a change in tone uh, where the AFL-CIO's official position became and still is to this day support for the, you know, the, the two-state solution uh, as envisioned by the, the Oslo Accords, which I think, as most of us know, that means that the, the state of Israel and kind of a not not a real state for Palestinians, but kind of a, a state that doesn't have any sovereignty, I guess. And it's just sort of broken up into blocks and chunks um, in the West Bank and, you know, a, a process, peace process that has really failed. Um, that's what the AFL-CIO's position um, has been for the last uh, 25, 30 years. Um, and the, since the beginning of the BDS movement, in 2005, the AFL-CIO leadership and presidents of the various affiliated unions have been fully against, the, you know, publicly denounced the BDS movement. They've called it anti-Semitic. What's kind of ironic there is that some of these labor leaders, like Richard Trumka, for example, the late president of the AFL-CIO, who back in the 1980s was president of the United Mine Workers, when he was president of the UMW, Trumka was, you know, one of the leading uh, figures in the labor movement boycotting South Africa, you know, to protest the to protest apartheid. Um, he the the there was a boycott of Shell um, because Shell was doing business with apartheid South Africa, and Trumka and the United Mine Workers were a big part of that. Trumka got arrested several times at the South African embassy. There's many quotes of him saying like it's a moral duty to boycott. And divest from you know this this uh, from apartheid South Africa. It's a it's a good uh, tactic. It's a good nonviolent tactic for human rights, etc. And then when the BDS movement started against Israel, he came out totally against it. This is wrong. We can't do this. It's anti-Semitic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, at the same time, with all this, there have been and Mimi mentioned this, and this is where I'll kind of wrap it up. Um, there have been rank and file efforts. The, the earliest I could find is 1949 uh, of rank and file union members um, question, at, at the very least, questioning U U.S. labor officials' support for the state of Israel. In 1949, uh, a group, a uh, rank and file group of members of the ILGWU in New York uh, sent a letter to David Dubinsky saying, "You know, you're giving all this money to to Israel. Could you also?" give some money to support Palestinian refugees who, this was 1949, just as the, the refugee crisis had begun. And Dubitsky responded by donating $5,000 to the American Friends Service Committee, which is uh, one of the humanitarian organizations that uh, was charged by the UN to support Palestinian refugees. $5,000, but at the same time, the ILGW was giving millions of dollars to Israel. So it was really nothing. But just the fact that they wrote that letter and they signed, it was originally a group of ILGW members who identified themselves in the letter as descendants of Arabic speaking people, which I think today we would just say Arab Americans, but I'm not sure if that phrase Arab Americans exactly existed yet in 1949. But they were the ones who started this letter and started signing it. But then they added a, a postscript where they said, when members of other nationalities heard about what we were doing they wanted to sign on too. So you could look at the this letter to Dubinsky and it also has like Italian American names and other names that presumably could be African American names. Um, so that's kind of a nice example. And then there's in the seventies in De Detroit, of course, there's the Arab workers caucus uh, inspired by the league of revolution, black workers who had a wildcat strike to support, to um, call on the UAW to drop its uh, state of Israel bonds. And then since during the time of the, especially since the second intifada uh, around 2002, um, the San Francisco Labor Council, for example, passed a resolution that was con condemning uh, Israel for invading the West Bank. They had, they had to, after a few weeks, the San Francisco Labor Council had to rescind that, uh, um, that resolution after, you know, being criticized and condemned for being anti-Semitic and so on. Um, but since for the last, you know, and then in 2004, I believe, Labor for Palestine um, 
was started in New York, a network of, you know, um, pro-Palestinian trade unionists, which is still a very active group. Um, so for the last 20 years or so, there's been kind of a sustained growing um, movement within labor's ranks to uh, push back against the traditional un the traditional support for Israel that's always been kind of unconditional. So I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we really appreciate that historical presentation. Uh, a lot of this history is unknown by most trade unions in the United States who are involved actually in the Palestine movement. So the more information we can get out, uh, the more uh, value that will be to workers who are trying to educate the entire working class about what's going on. Uh, one of the interesting things that most people don't know about is Golda Meir's uh, statue is in the afl cio headquarters. And uh, it's a Zionist organization, and that's one of the reasons they haven't even taken a position on the ceasefire. But one of the things that most workers don't know about in this country is the relationship of not only Israel to the United States, but Israel to South Africa. And David Hempson, who's our next speaker, uh, was an organizer in Durban during the 1973 uh, uprising against apartheid and organizing on the docks. He's a researcher and uh, uh, has been doing a, an immense amount of labor research around uh, the struggle of South Africans and now also the relationship of Israel and what happened in South Africa with the United States, the CIA, and the history dude. So welcome, David. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks for uh, Mimi and uh, for Jeff for, uh, you know, passing on quite a valuable view um, of uh, how the issue of uh, Palestine and Israel has been posed in the labor movement and uh, some, some details which uh, actually resonate with me because while I was organizing the dock workers, I was also the uh, research officer uh, I think I was 23 years old, <laughs> of the uh, Garment and Textile Union. And uh, we had quite intimate relations or exchanges with the ILGW. I'll just make a point about that uh, later on. Uh, look, the, the main issue I think that we're confronting is that when the labor movement is not strong and addresses key issues such as the rise of fascism in the 1930s, or the rise of Zionism during the same uh, period as a response to fascism, then we just move from disaster to disaster and we find ourselves now in a situation where the best uh, minds are in the labor movement are at least appealing for a ceasefire, but it's actually catastrophe after catastrophe. Um, it, keeps, it keeps me up at night just, just thinking about the slaughter that, that's going on there. And seeing well, I don't want to go into those those details, but really, it it, it does it does affect me quite quite a bit, and I imagine it affects anyone who's who's actually interested in 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 the future of humanity. How the, how did we get in such a mess? And this is what I'm trying to address. Um, and thanks for the opportunity, Steve, because I've actually learned quite a bit, some of which I could have learned a little faster from Jeff and Mimi if I'd read your work. Um, but some of it uh, was necessary homework in 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 uh, in the development of, of of these points I'm going to make. The first point I would like to make is that really the Histra Drut is not a trade union. You see, I'd always thought um, that it was something of a trade union. It's true; it does have some social welfare for Jewish workers, and now it's forced, I think, now to uh, provide those uh, facilities to uh, Palestinian workers who are in Israel. But it actually is a it it it, ha it resonates in my head uh, with what we had in the white labor movement in in South Africa, where it is if you're white you're right and uh, workers of the world unite for a white South Africa. It's exactly that. It's it's a racist idea. Now I, I, that hadn't really come through to me clearly until I'd, I'd gone into you know into into this uh, work. What I'm going to touch on is how the history uh, worked. Uh, together with the AFL-CIO uh, and the uh, TUC, the Trade Union Council of, of, of Britain, in managing uh, trade unions in South Africa. I'll keep that a bit short because uh, it's all about positioning. Uh, the uh, TUC historically was the colonial master of Africa, 
uh, sorry, the British Empire was, you know, had the TUC uh, to defend uh, its its uh, colonization and so forth, and to uh, help uh, direct or guide or control uh, the unions that developed. And that's part of the uh, issue that we've had in South Africa to free ourselves from that bondage, but not to enter the bondage with the uh, AFL uh, CRO. Uh, and to be a genuine independent uh, labor movement, which can make its international relations sectorally in the uh, uh, metal or textile or in, in that way, and politically with, uh, with with groups around the world. And uh, there's been a, a long tradition in, in South Africa of, of participating internationally in one union grouping or rather like the WFTU or the ICFTU, and both actually have, have been a disaster actually for the uh, South African labor movement and have not taken us forward at all. But uh, just keep that in mind when, when I'm criticizing the, uh, you know, the AFL. So we, you know, the history of it, uh, from my experience, and and I see it uh, actually being resonated from what's been mentioned now, uh, was there in the ICFTU. This, I'm talking about the 1970s and so forth. But as a major wing of that, um, the AFL CEO didn't participate in the ICFTU, or did or didn't. It just depended on the, on the weather. <laughs> By the way, catastrophic leadership, uh, changing its mind, and and uh, with the most foul language, and and uh, you know possible, um, which which rubbed everyone up the wrong way. Um, but, uh, you know, that is what they, they did. And then the TUC largely handled the issues uh, as they arose in English-speaking uh, Africa. But what is important, and it uh, relates to what we're discussing uh, quite sharply, is that the history of the created Afro-Asian Labor Institute in 1960 as a kind of clone of the uh, Af uh, Afro-American, what is called the African-American uh, Labor Institute, uh, in Washington, D.C., which came and went, and no one seems to have noticed what, what's, what's happened to it now. But it, it was, it, and then the tactics there were that, um, just remember that Israel, even though it emerged uh, in, in, in terrible bloodshed, uh, still had some credibility as a something of a social democratic attempt to reconstruct society or something of kind for those who didn't really understand the nature of Zionism. So could you believe it that the uh, Israeli state and, uh, was invited uh, to the Bandung Conference? That is the conference of anti-imperialist groups, uh, which happened in Indonesia and Bandung. I mean, that invitation was withdrawn, but it was just touch and go whether it would have participated. That was an enormous advantage to the AFL or to the US, but also to the AFL, because it meant that uh, the history could do all kinds of things because it would seem to be independent from a uh, U.S. government and had some credibility uh, in in Africa and and uh, Asia. But uh, what we have seen is that the history of it, as I mentioned, is not just a, a well. It has some uh, pretensions as a, as a, as a trade union, but it is also the biggest employer in Israel. I, this was astonishing to me to understand. But if you understand all the com the, the work uh, that it's done in terms of uh, concentrating capital and doing banking, housing, uh, education, uh, and in the beginning, it seemed to serve as a kind of nucleus of the Israeli uh, state itself with the militia uh, and, and, and uh, all, all of that. Um, and because of that, its, inter it's um, intervention in South Africa has not really been on the trade union field until the 1980s, but it was very much involved in the development of the armaments industry in South Africa. So how could a trade union be involved in the armaments industry? It's unbelievable. But because they had companies in uh, in Israel uh, which were breaking free from uh, French, they had a deal with, with the French armaments uh, industry, and that broke down uh, in the 1970s, or, they, or the, you know, France refused to, to continue it. That meant that Israel, and the history route was involved in this, uh, was involved in helping South Africa, which was also suffering from arms ban, to develop its own arm, uh, arms industry. And I had to serve in the South African military uh, for a period don't worry, I was in active opposition and, 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 and shut them up when they tried to uh, come with the idea that we were dealing with terrorists. 
But as I said, well, look, I'm a terrorist too. I'm a communist, by the way. And they were so shocked. Uh, I said, well, you can expel me. I wouldn't mind not doing the military service. But uh, in the end, the guys would say, hey, what's really happening here? Uh, are we really going to win this? I said, guys, you're going to lose. But don't cry because I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work out. Well, anyway, look, let me not ramble on about that. But I was based in the north of, uh, just south of Mozambique. And there, there was a um, a rocket uh, area, an area for uh, trying out rockets. And that was known then, and that was in the 1970s, to be an, a joint Israeli-South African project. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to disentangle a history of it from all of this because it was involved. It was inter It's an intimate part of the uh, Israeli state. Uh, and there it was, trying out... Um, uh, you know, all, all their rockets uh, in, in, a, in a beautiful area of, of uh, which should have been protected against any military operations, you know, at all. And then just to mention another fact, that then led to the nuclear uh, power uh, being developed and then and the bomb being developed in Israel. That arose out of collaboration uh, with, with South Africa because South Africa provided the, uh, the uranium uh, for that uh, bomb to be uh, prepared and made. And obviously, the transaction went uh, went both ways, uh, so that uh, you know all the uh, advanced uh, and uh, technology that was needed to to make the bomb uh, was available to South Africa. I was in Dar es Salaam in exile uh, at a university there in 1979, and we heard on the 27th of uh, September 1979 uh, that there was a an explosion. Uh, somewhere down towards the uh, Antarctic, uh, Marian Island. And we knew what had happened. I mean, there was fear in Dar es Salaam and the university and elsewhere because we knew that South Africa had the bomb. But it wasn't South Africa's bomb. It was actually a Israeli trying out the, their bomb uh, together with the South Africans and teaching uh, them, uh, you know, how, how you know how to build. So it's it's hard to disentangle this as uh, Jeff has ma uh, mentioned to disentangle history of it from from the uh, you know from the state. But there is an integration and in, on at the trade union level in this way. In the nineteen seventies, uh, you know, we developed independent trade union movement. It was we we struggled very with very little support uh, internationally, but we you know it was a bootstrap bootstrap operation with bannings. I mean, none of us lasted for more than nine months or, or or a year or so forth before we were declared communists and house arrested and then banned from all kind of future kinds of work. Uh, so it 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 was a it, it was a massive struggle which wasn't uh, you know um you know supported by the AFL uh, CRO or the uh, TUC at all because it was independent. We were struggling to be independent. Uh, from uh, you know, from the traditional uh, dominators of 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 our country, and to build a, a build a, a base for a freedom movement, which wouldn't be another nationalist movement, which would lead the workers into disaster, but would lead on towards uh, genuine uh, trade unions uh, and uh, the vision of socialism, which we talked about in the Workers' Party and so forth. I won't go into you know all that, but the AFL CEO when it saw that the, the unions were developing rapidly, uh, it, it did its best to try and divide and, uh, and, and uh, you know, try and break up the union. Uh, I, I don't, I'm sure that all the people participating here knew that South Africa had Bantu stones. And one of the Bantu stones, uh, the one particularly in, the, in Natal, in the area on the, on the eastern sea coast, uh, was the uh, Zulu uh, Bantu stone headed by uh, Chief Gacho Botelezi, who has uh, no pretensions to be the actual traditional leader. He, it was all, I won't go into, into all the tricks that he played to get into power. He got his brother uh, deported uh, out of the area by the state. I mean, he, he came to power uh, through uh, by hook or by crook. Uh, but, you know, out of the blue, without having done anything to support the labor movement, in fact, through um, undermining and killing uh, students who opposed him, and and breaking up strikes and 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 the rest. Out of the blue, the AFL CIO declared that uh, Gacha Botelezi uh, was uh, to be awarded the George Meany Human Rights Award for fighting for trade unions. Even the right wing trade unions couldn't believe it. He'd done absolutely nothing, but he had attended Washington. He was, uh, you know, the quote-unquote peaceful leader that the CIA was looking for, 
Uh, and so they just threw out that award. I, 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 it, oddly enough, there's not even a picture of him accepting the award. It was an absolute, as I said, the uh, leadership was kind of disastrous. It did impulsive things. Not even the people that wanted the AFL-CIO to be involved in South Africa could understand what on earth happened. Uh, it was a it was a disaster, but it showed where they wanted it to go. I was in uh, I met up with the IFCFTU in 1976 uh, when I was uh, banned and, and and ended up in exile, and I was shown a secret document. I was told I had to see it, and I wasn't allowed to copy it, and so forth. And that was a letter from the AFL CIO to the ICFTU. And remember, they didn't participate. Uh, in the ICFDU. They wanted to manipulate it from outside. And that said that they were going to give, uh, AFLC, I was going to give uh, Gacho Butelezi $1 million. That was a huge sum at that time to organize trade unions. I think we, if we managed to get something like $5,000 a year to organize ourselves with a bootstrap uh, uh, strap operation that we had, we would have said that is great. Imagine a million dollars being put in the hands of one of those who was uh, turning out to be one of the great persecutors and killers uh, of the uh, emerging uh, trade union movement in, in South Africa. And what did uh, happen, uh, I won't go into all the uh, it, it, details because of, of time, but then as the uh, workers' insurgency developed in the 1980s, uh, from really from the early 1980s onwards until 1985 was general strike after general strike, making South Africa ungovernable by the uh, nationalist uh, party, the racist regime of, of the time. The AFL suddenly became very involved. Uh, um, Butelezi suddenly remembered that he was the hero of the AFL-CIO. So he launched a trade union. UWUSA, U-W-U-S-A, United Workers Union of South Africa, which actually was just a killing organization. In fact, it even launched itself as a killing organization with a coffin uh, as uh, in leading uh, uh, of, of a militia. And the uh, slogan was death to Kusatu. Kusatu was the national movement, uh, the, the grouping of the trade unions of the time, which was espousing uh, liberation and socialism. And their slogan was death to Kusatu, and they carried a coffin to show what they were going to do. And that was supported by the AFL, CIO. And now I've only just discovered that uh, Butelezi had actually visited uh, Israel in 1985, and that the deal was made with the history uh, which had, of course, many parts to it. So it had a trade union side, although they didn't seem to that didn't really get developed in South Africa. What they did have was a militia, a killing organization, a death squad. And, you know, the regime in, uh, from 1986 onwards uh, developed uh, and trained up, uh, the, you know, the uh, killers. Uh, in Nawusa and in Akata, and is, it's no doubt that history was was involved in, in all of this, as well as providing the arms, uh, the uh, rockets, and all the other apparatus, you know, that the apartheid regime, um, you know, had. Just to move on to conclusions and to, well, just one update. You know, we, we have Israeli uh, and Zionist investment in South Africa. In fact, three years ago, in uh, 20... 21, we had a strike of clover workers. That's a dairy workers, the biggest dairy company in South Africa, was bought out uh, by an Israeli company. Uh, and immediately it put it cut the uh, wages, it put the workers on short time and all the rest. They wanted to cut the workers at least by a third uh, and to raise their profits and to integrate uh, the production into the uh, Israeli economy and not uh, based on, on, on South African uh, production. A complete scam. But the ANC government, which of course now has got all the credit for having gone to the ICJ, actually defended that resolutely against the criticism that we in exile, well, I'm apparently in a way outside of the country, uh, but um, fought for by the General Workers Union of, of South Africa, which was waging that strike, Talking to the ministers, demanding that they, you know, uh, upend the uh, this investment, which was a disinvestment because actually it meant extracting uh, capital from South Africa, and they and that went ahead. 
It was a fantastic strike. Unfortunately, it wasn't a, a complete 100% victory, but it showed the uh, resistance that would be there. But in, in the end, uh, you know, we found that, it, it, you know, the government actually defended the uh, regime, I mean, that uh, company to the end, uh, and the workers actually had to stand down, and and and, and it was a very bit, bitter pill indeed. Now we support that, uh, you know, going to the ICJ in that sense, but with our eyes wide open. We know that uh, ANC is, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's developed into quite a, a rotten and corrupt uh, leadership. Uh, and electricity is uh, only partially available. The, the railways have collapsed completely. Uh, the ports and harbors are meant to be uh, well run by the, by the state. Instead of that, now they're offering it all for privatization. It's a disaster for the working class. But at least it's, it, you know, it's struggled now to put forward a, a bright face of uh, revolution, or at least, uh, you know, a solidarity, you know, with, with the Palestinians. And that part, you know, we support. Uh, but it does open up the question about how we then move into the future. We are very keen um, when I'm saying the we here, I'm talking about South Africans inside the country. I'm, I'm talking about the Transport Union, uh, General Workers Union of South Africa and others uh, to be able to build up in a really effective uh, you know, anti-Zionist movement, but more pro-Palestinian to stop the slaughter and to put forward an idea for it, which would unite the working class uh, in our various countries and to be able to bring peace and harmony and development, which seems an almost impossible dream. It's only a dream that we could entertain as part of the working class. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, there's there's much, much more, I think, on in, in the history of Jude in Israel and South Africa and the relationship. But I did see that at the museum, the apartheid museum in uh, Johannesburg. They have the Israeli tanks that were uh, built by the Histadrut that were used to attack and kill the South African people. So it's there's evidence. They don't mention, though, that Israel was supporting as well as the United States. Our next speaker is Carol Lang. Carol is a professor at CUNY. She's a member of the AFT PSC. And she has been involved in a struggle inside the union over the issue of Zionism and for the union to take a position uh, against the Zionist regime and uh, for uh, uh, the Palestinians. So welcome, Carol. That was incredibly upsetting, David. Um, but, you know, Israel was certainly part and parcel of um, it, it, you know, the South African, the apartheid regime fighting against, you know, liberation of the uh, the South African workers. Um, you know, the American working class, unfortunately, doesn't know really very much about what's happening. And so whenever I mention that our dues is going to Israel to build bombs and, and kill Palestinians, people are just amazed. And one of the things that I stumbled over, you know, while I was writing my article, was the fact that um, the Jewish Labor Committee, which Randy Weingarten is in, and she's the president of my union, basically said that um, really that they have to keep all of this under wraps and they don't want anybody to know how much money is being given to, um, to Israel and people should just be quiet about the whole thing. So, of course, nobody knows anything that's going on. Uh, um, <clears throat> I, ra I raised a resolution. There, there's a ceasefire resolution going on around, which is toothless and pretty meaningless. Um, and so we had an hour long discussion in my union about whether we should sign on to the ceasefire resolution. And ultimately, people agreed that they should do that. And I abstained because it called for the release of the Israeli hostages and didn't say anything about the Palestinians, the thousands of them are, who are imprisoned all the time. And so, I mean, I thought it was pretty bad. So I raised a resolution after that. And this is just the, you know, I'm starting out with the connection between, you know, what people were talking about before about the AFL-CIO and, and its relationship to the history of Um So, so I raised a resolution condemning the AFL-CIO leadership for supporting <coughs> materially the, um, which we call it, the Israeli government. And I said, listen, if you want a real ceasefire, then you have to turn off the spigot, which means that we have to stop giving money to Israel. 
And as soon as I said that, some Zionists, this was all orchestrated because everybody knew I was raising it. Some Zionists got up and immediately said, called the question. So that means in any Robert's Rules um, situation that you can't have a discussion anymore. So anybody who was waiting to talk about supporting my resolution was was sort of dumbfounded because they just weren't able to say anything. And of course, my resolution lost, but I got 17 votes. Um, even a lot of the radicals in the union refused to support it. And since they weren't able to speak, I didn't ex actually know what their um, position was. But, you know, the AFL, as, as um, Jeff said, has a very long-standing relationship with the history Jut. But the history Jut, <coughs> as bad as David describes the unions in South Africa as being for whites only, the history Jut was never a union. It's not only a racist institution, but it was never a union. And as a matter of fact, the Ben Gurions and the Golda Meir has basically said that um, the Israeli state would have never gotten off the ground if it wasn't for the history Jut. And he was on the his the body of the history Jut, and he became, um, you know, what you call it, the uh, president of of. Um, which we call it of, of Israel, and he started the Mapai, the Labor Party, but also the Haganot, which is a terrorist organization in South Africa. Um, so that the the thing about the history Jut is that the history Jut um, was a capitalist institution. It owned and controlled twenty five percent of the capitalist industries in South in in Israel. So it wasn't just like our normal AFL CIO, where um, you know, the, the, as bad as it is, is trying to negotiate contracts. I mean, they basically were not only capitalists themselves and owned twenty five percent of the industry. But anybody, especially in their their industries that would act independently and want to, to fight for higher wages, they would prevent them from going out on strike. So, I mean, they were almost a classic. I'm not saying that Israel is fascist because it's not at that point. But, but Ben-Gurion and people like him modeled himself after people like Mussolini, where trade unions... <clears throat> really weren't independent. They had, they were on the body of the this corporation in in Mussolini's you know, way of organizing the state. Um, and but but they weren't independent organizations. And in reality, the history was never really an independent organization. And on top of that, it was always a racist organization. So it never fought for any sort of Palestinian rights whatsoever. There were times where um, workers went out on strike, like for instance, in 1951, the seamen went out on strike and Ben-Gurion tried to starve the seamen to get to come back to work. And the history Jews supported the Ben-Gurion in that endeavor. In 1928, um, Golda Meir said, I was put on the history Jude executive committee at a time when this big labor union wasn't just the trade union organization, it was a colonizing agency. Oh, by the way, I want to thank Tony Greenstein for a lot of the information because he, you know, he provided a lot of this information that I'm using right now. And by the way, he was arrested for a day for tweeting something about Hamas. And it's apparently illegal in Britain now and it's becoming quite... Um, uh, repressive in 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 Britain and in Germany and places like that to say anything in support of the Palestinians. Um, so there was a, a, a what you call it, and, and they organized this during the period that Mussolini was coming to power, um, and he was their model. So in 1920, there was another demonstration uh, strike, and once again the history drew stepped in and allowed the the strike to be broken um even though israel hadn't been a state yet but this was a this was a project that was 
coming into fruition and the, the history was part of that project. So in some ways, as bad as the, the um, you know, the unions were in South Africa, as racist as they were, this was a, a part of a colonizing project on the part of the history that wanted to set up the, the establishment of an Israeli state. Ben Gurion said, who was, you know, I, I would argue that he was a, really a classic fascist, even though you can't say that Israel was, there was no Israel at the time, but you can't say that, you know, it would have become fascist. But Ben Gurion said the role of the working class was a national one. He claimed socialism was never an aim in itself, even though a lot of the Jewish workers saw themselves as being socialists of some variety or other. He said, but it was a tool for the advancement of the national objectives. So Israel was the national objectives. He coined the slogan from class to nation. And so, I mean, all of the elements of this fascist ide ideology and language was incorporated in the, the Zionist language, even though they considered themselves socialist or leftists or pretending to be so, um, you know, and, but in fact, they weren't. Um, so the history, as, as I said, organized the Haganah, which was a terrorist group. It organized the Labor Party, the Mapai. Um, and, you know, essentially, it, it you know, it, it pulled out or, or, you know, threw out by the Nakba in, in 1948, 750,000 Palestinians. Uh, there, the racism, the national sympathy, the that kind of thing was very much, I would argue, modeled on people like Mussolini. And if anybody's interested, since I'm not going to talk about, you know, their relationship with the Nazis or with Mussolini, Lenny Brenner wrote a book called "In the Time of the Dictators," and I would recommend that. Um. Okay, so so they weren't be you know averse to to breaking you know strikes even of of Palestine, of um, of Israeli workers or Jewish workers I should say since they weren't Israeli at the time. Um, <coughs> ben Gurion was your classic racist. He basically said that he didn't see Palestinians having any rights. He was a a profound racist. And basically, he he took his arguments from Theodore Herzl, who was this you know fascist who had this Jewish supremacist uh, mentality, and and Ben Gurion said that you know he doesn't believe he didn't believe that the the Palestinians should have the same rights as the the Jews because they weren't capable of building the country and they were still awaiting the builders. And so those builders were the Jews that were coming from Europe. Um, so the, the, you know, you could see with the domestic policy, it's not so far fetched or not so hard to understand that, you know, the, um, the Israeli government sided with every reactionary country um, and especially South Africa. It helped South Africa build its weapons. Um, and the, the company called Iskor Steel was owned by the Histrojud. 49% of it was owned by, the, um, 51%, sorry, was owned by the Histrojud. 49% was owned by South Africa. And these are the people that built steel, which built arms to, to kill um, black South Africans um, in their struggle the, for their anti-apartheid struggle. Um, the party furnished steel was shipped to South Africa uh, from, from Israel, enabling the apartheid state to escape tariffs. And um, companies such as Tadiran and Sultan were especially complicit in supplying South Africa with weaponry. It also helped to build the electronic wall between South Africa and Namibia, and which are now two separate countries, obviously, and the neighboring African states. So 
so they're were completely complicit in supporting the South African government in its repression against the South African masses. In the 1960s, the history was a conduit for the CIA and Mossad in Africa and later cooperated with the AFL AFIELD program and the CIA to undermine rural cooperatives in El Salvador. <coughs> It also suppressed class struggle at home, which I mentioned um, discriminated against the Arabs, even though the Arabs has to pay um, dues to the history drug, it gets nothing in return. It, it not only was not protected against the boss, but it got none of the social welfare programs that the Jews received. Um, okay, so the AFL, CIO, as everybody has said already, has given millions and millions, I don't even know how many millions of dollars to um, the, the uh, history droid. Uh, somebody mentioned the Teamsters running guns. The te Teamsters ran guns to, to the history droid. <coughs> um, and um, the, the, I, I remember I was in another union in DC 37 at one point before I was in the PSC and the D DC 37, I, I, I raised the resol a resolution saying that DC, DC 37 should divest from Israeli bonds. And I was doing some you know, search about where these Israeli bonds were being invested and they were being invested in schools that were religious schools that taught hate against the Palestinians. So when I raised it in the DC 37, because I was a delegate at the moment, uh, the person who was the secretary slammed her gavel down and she said, we won't, I mean, everybody looked at me like I was speaking Chinese, um, but, every, but she slammed the gavel down and said, we won't have any racism here in this union, as if I was being anti-Semitic. And then the next month, the resolution was absolutely pulled. So there was no question of even having any discussion about it. So the, the AFL-CIO has absolute control over whether there's going to be any discussions about its role, its relationship to the Palestinians at all. Um, so as I said, you know, the Randy Weingarten, who actually is now supporting a ceasefire, and I think largely because that ceasefire resolution has is absolutely meaningless. I, I wrote a critique of it in um, what you call it in covert action, if anybody's interested in taking a look at it. But it absolutely has no teeth. So now, since so many people are voting for a uh, ceasefire, Randy Weingarten had her fist up in the air and said she supports the ceasefire also. It's just all these people are just fake and phony. Um, so sorry. So so in the resolution that I raised, and this was in October, um, initially the executive committee, the the woman who's on the the secretary, when I asked her, could it be put on the floor? Because it has to be passed by the executive committee first before it goes to the delegate assembly, which is what I'm on. And she said, we didn't even consider this. This just went right by us. Like it was, you know, it was nothing. And I said, well, I would like you to, I would like us to consider it. So essentially I forced her to put it on the floor. And I actually thanked her for putting it on the floor. And she was like, don't thank me. I didn't do anything. So I said, okay, well, I'll thank myself for pushing you to do it. And then, as I said, I raised the resolution and immediately within a second, some Zionists got up and um, ended up saying, call the question. So that was the end of it. In 2021, the International Committee, which is when I'm on, at the, on the PSC, wrote a resolution up defending the Palestinians, and the Zionists went crazy and, and got at least 200 people to drop out of the union. And so now the union is so freaked out because all it cares about is money 
you know, wants the dues. It's not particularly interested in having, you know, this dialogue and discussion about anything. Um, in fact, when I I told my I'm on the executive committee in my my chapter, and I told my my what you call it my chapter chair that I was going to be raising this. He went nuts. And he said, you're trying to bust the union. You're trying to break the union. You want to blow up the union. And I went, no, I would like us to have a conversation about this. And so, I mean, basically, you know, we didn't have the conversation, but at least I got it on the floor. Um, the And I'm sure Lisa is going to talk more about this, but the, um, the National AFL-CIO Western Field Director, Fernando Lozada, said expressions of solidarity are always good, but in terms of setting international policy, that is the purview of the National AFL-CIO throughout its organizing process. There is an existing policy in solidarity with working people in the Holy Land. It does not include BDS. The AFL-CIO leadership cited a procedural rule to tell the San Francisco Labor Council that it could not even debate a resolution on BDS. So, you know, it's all locked down. Um, although I think because of the demonstrations that are happening every day, thousands of people being out on the street, they're being pressured to, you know, open up the discussion somewhat because it's clear, I mean, people have gone at closed Grand Central Station in New York and block the bridges and block the bridges in California. So, so they have to do something in order to figure out how to bring things back to some normalcy, um, even though I don't think that they're ever going to be able to get control of this because more and more people, in fact, just as an aside, I went into my class and my first day of class and I mentioned Gaza and I said, do you know what's going on? And this is the first time everybody said, of course, what are you talking about? So that, you know, things have, I think, have significantly shifted. And so the unions are going to have to figure out what to do in order to reel all this back in. Um, so I just want to end by saying that, it, you know, my article in Covert Action, Action was really about Shireen, the, the Palestinian-American journalist who was shot by the Israelis and still there's no investigation. The, the AFL-CIO showed no remorse for her, said nothing about it. I mean, it's just utter shame, utter shameful about the way that they behaved. I mean, this is, this is a journalist and a, a Palestinian American journalist who was murdered by the Israelis. And you could see a picture of Randy Weingarten sitting with the head of the Labor Party and, and with Liz Schuler, you know, all smiling, even after, you know, Shireen was killed. So I, I just want to say, in order to bring justice to Shireen, um, we must get rid of these fake labor organizations that, that pretend to, to support the working class. But, you know, so far, um, Largely, people have been more and more impoverished because of these people's unwillingness to fight um, and, and, and explain that labor Zionism is really a fraud. I mean, it was never, it was Zionist, which basically makes it nationalist and makes it racist by the very nature of it. Um, and 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 Ben Gurion and Golda Meir and all of those people basically argued that that's the way it was going to be. That this is, you know, a project moving towards nationalism, not towards internationalism, not towards defending the working class. Ben, in fact, Ben Gurion basically ended up saying that his project was about organizing Jewish labor in opposition to Arab labor. And that's the way that he viewed, you know, the, the class struggle was about going against Arab labor. So we must stand with the Palestinians and get rid of this rotten leadership that is holding us back from fighting, not only for the Palestinians, but for decent contracts as well. So my contract has been up for a year 
and my there is absolutely no movement around it. And so I, I completely identify with Palestinians, not just because Palestinians are oppressed by Israelis, but the fact is, is unless these labor fakers get thrown out of office and we have a revolutionary leadership of the unions, that more and more people, the contracts are, are uh, clearly worse and worse. If anybody has looked at the DC 37 contract, they've lost immeasurable amounts of money. And it looks like, you know, it's unlikely that the PSC is going to get a contract anytime soon. So that's it. Thank you, Carol. So our last speaker is Elizabeth Milos. Uh, she's an interpreter, a uh, Chilean American and a member of uh, UPTI, United Union of Professional Technical Employees, UCSF. It's a statewide local. She's also uh, with UPTI Workers for Palestine and Healthcare Workers for Palestine. Before I introduce her, I, I want to say that there is a very important development that's taken place because actually this uprising of, of working people in the United States, of activists, is uh, probably the biggest since the 1960s. And an example of that in the Bay Area and all over the country, there are these chat groups, signal chat groups of over 400, maybe 500 healthcare workers from all different unions, interns, residents, doctors, all coming together, nurses, uh, to take up the fight of the Palestinians. And that has never happened before. And using social media, actually, this is a whole historic development of workers organizing and getting educated. So I think that this is going to be a very important political development, not only on the relationship to Palestine, but the crisis in the unions, the fight against fascism, and the fight against the Democratic Party, which is a key supporter of uh, the Israeli state, the Zionist state. So welcome, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you very much. I'm a member of University of Professional and Technical Employees uh, that has uh, represents uh, 17,000 workers in the University of California system and three uh, colleges, community colleges in California. We are uh, part of the health and education sector of the Communication Workers of America, the national one. Um, and I've been a member since 2009 uh, of that organization. Um, a lot of you have already stated most of the, you know, very important things. What Steve was alluding to or mentioning is this emerging movement that I was talking about. And in particular, uh, this has been going on in many uh, university settings um, in centers of learning. And um, the there is this incredible need for more education. People are actually asking for more education. They are seeking it out regarding the whole history and what is this, what has been going on. And many people are incredibly surprised at the level of, of enmeshment, complicity, uh, however you want to call it, that the U.S. has had historically towards Zionism. And at the University of California in particular, uh, we've been dealing with a lot of different things. University of California, San Francisco and, and Berkeley and, and other places as well. Um, there's been a lot of actions going on. Um, let me just go back a little bit to what Carol had alluded to, had mentioned uh, regarding the AFL-CIO statement. Uh, back in 2021, I was a, lay, I was a delegate for my uh, union. My union, UPTI, had, had uh, at the time a uh, political um, social justice committee that was formed and we created a resolution and passed a resolution at the executive uh, council uh, uh, executive committee level on June 2nd, two, 2021, that included divesting from and breaking links with Histridut. Now, at the Labor Council, when I brought that resolution to the delegates who, were, who I knew would be most in support of, of passing a resolution at the Labor Council level, um, there was, you know, this distinct reticence from mentioning Histridut. And there was this idea that maybe we should just stick to BDS and stop in USAID. And so, okay, we did that. We did a resolution like that. And we tried to get it passed on June 14th, but um, it was sent to a commission. And unfortunately, um, even though uh, some of the, uh, another union had also passed the resolution within their own local uh, in May, 
um, you know, uh, seeking uh, to stop the U.S. aid to Israel and for in support of BDS, um, they they did they were not present uh, for that particular vote. Um, there was a change in leadership, and the change in, the new change in leadership, which was expected to even be better than the previous one, did not get sworn in until. Um, they they did not get sworn in until August, for example. Um, by that time, um, we this was tabled or was sent to commission um, because the APAC supporter on the Labor Council, um, Olga Miranda from SEIU Local 87, uh, she was able to get it sent to committee, and um, and then the Building and Trades they immediately put out word in the media, in the news media, saying that BDS was off the table. And then by September, we got a letter from the AFL-CIO saying exactly what Carol had mentioned, that, that, that we did not have any right to uh, discuss this at the Labor Council level, even though that was in direct contradiction to um, the history of the San Francisco Labor Council, which had opposed the Vietnam War, even though the national AFL-CIO had, had, had supported the war. Um, I. I think that there's a, a, a really, there's a lot of people think, well, what do you do with these resolutions anyways? I mean, what are they for, right? Um, what kind of, are they binding? What, you know, it depends, I guess, it depends on what you do with those resolutions, right? You bring those resolutions and you use it as an organizing tool and as an educational tool. And as such, I also brought a resolution to the CWA National Convention in 2021 which was called uh, out of order by the head of the resolutions department, um, at resolutions committee. And they themselves stated that they work closely with history. Dude. Now, I think that we, one thing that we, that the labor movement is, is not taking into consideration is the level of enmeshment that exists between the, um, the uh, prison system um, and the police system and the arms system and workers that actually work in those areas. And um, <clears throat> I wouldn't call police workers. Let's start from there, okay? <laughs> I don't call policemen workers. <laughs> uh, um, but there's a very, one thing has been coming out uh, late is that the young people that have been organizing around Palestine have been joining up it from also from the sector of the um, uh, prison abolition movement as well. And one of the things that we we need to see is that if you look at all of the corporate uh, war weapons manufacturing companies and all of those uh, all of those things, it's not only Israel bonds, but it's also weapons and the manufacture of those weapons and who's working at those factories. They have to do a lot with what's going on. I, I, we at UPDI obviously were the health and education sector, but within CWA there are, you know, uh, people who work in weapons manufacturing. There's also people who work in the IT area, right? Um, the IT area is also very enmeshed with um, Israel in in respect to the surveillance systems and 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 things like that as well. So there's there's a lot of things that we need to uh, look at, and and. And this fight is is a very it's going to be a very uh, strong one where we're going to need uh, to to join uh, forces with the with with the uh, uh, prison abolitionist movement. We're going to need to join forces with the anti um, police brutality movement because you know we've already seen you know. The training that the uh, Israel has given to the police forces uh, around the country of the U.S., not only in the U.S., but also in Chile, for example, they've done that in Chile as well. Um, and the 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 issue, though, that I wanted to bring about was something that I um, I think that a lot more education needs to happen in terms of not only democrat democratizing our unions, but uh, education as to uh, what Zionism really is, because Zionism did not come about as part of the Second World War. It came about in 1897 as a settler colonial uh, project, uh, ideology. And it really, at, at this stage, like Carol was mentioning, how they promised that this was going to be a Jewish um, 
you know, movement that was going to keep going. What they, you know, in fact, they they've already gotten there. Their level. I I, w I just read something very recently, and I put it in the chat um, called Kahanism and the American um, Politics, um, and the level of enmeshment that exists with the with the um, um, with the um, it's called. Kahanism and American politics, the, the Democratic Party's decades long courtship of racist fanatics. And it's written by a journalist, David Sheen, an Israeli journalist, David Sheen, which tracks the incredible level of enmeshment and, and, and um, influence that uh, this far right sector of the Zionist movement, um, the actual terrorist sector of the Zionist movement, the ones who've actually done bombings, the ones who've been who've been uh, declaring for more than several decades now, they've been actually declaring open ethnic cleansing and open elimination of Palestinians from that land. It's not a secret. Um, and the, this uh, Kahanism is from, is under the name of Mayor, the Rabbi Mayor Kahan, Kahane, who uh, was very influential in developing ties with uh, the ultra Christian nationalist, ultra right wing, sector of uh, American politics, but also would definitely cross aisles and go into the Democratic Party. They have close ties to Chuck Schumer, uh, close ties to um, uh, the, uh, the, Cl the Clintons um, and, um, and, and, and many others, including uh, this article, this uh, document in particular was more specific to New York politics and the um, district attorney races and the Senate races and things like that. But uh, we've seen, for example, in and you see this uh, crackdown on the uh, University of California on academic freedom. In fact, they're trying to pass a resolution. They're trying to pass something right now to to target uh, people who criticize Israel in any way, um, where there's these very uh, ties, these very troubling ties that um, the, the Canary Mission, for example, um, the uh, media attack dog uh, arm of the Zionists has been supported by the Diller Foundation, which is a foundation that actually supports. And Helen Diller is the cancer, the, the cancer, cancer research institute of UCSF is called Helen Diller. And so there's this, the, the ties are so strong that a lot of doctors and uh, people are facing um, disciplinary and 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 uh, investigatory meetings for speaking out on Palestine. So this is affecting academic freedom. This is affecting, uh, we're, and we're not hearing anything from our unions regarding how they are going to be defending us. We're not hearing anything. At Upti, for example, the new leadership that took over, they that you that that resolution that we passed in 2021 was scuttled and was hidden and all the resolutions were taken off the website and they were completely whitewashed and we were asking for more than a year for them to put it back on. Finally, they did put out this very lukewarm resolution on ceasefire, but um, they still haven't put anything back on the website. The All of these different healthcare workers that have been involved and who are working, they're all mostly, they're, they're rank and file basically. And they're, and they're uh, trying to get things passed at the union level. Uh, I, I CWA also recently passed a, also a pretty lukewarm one as well uh, resolution only because there seemed to have been a lot of pressure from below uh, in terms of many uh, emails and many pre a lot of a lot of um, a, but but it was uh, how can I say this there's there's this they're saying progressive except for Palestine right. I'm also a member of uh, the KPFA Listener Station Board, and um, we tried to get a resolution passed at the KPFA um, for uh, a ceasefire back in the previous uh, meetings, and the majority on the KPFA LSB, the supermajority, the protectors, the ones who've been um, in general uh, trying to dismantle the last remaining um, independent um, media network uh, left or progressive media network in the country, um, they said it was posturing and they didn't pass it. And then afterwards, 
when it started going out in more social media, it seems like the listeners and people were asking KPFA, which is basically considered a, a, a standard uh, for what you would consider left journalism instead of NPR journalism, which is what people were hearing, um, they, they, they started coming out with more news. And then the donations increased because they started getting out more information. The, the, the programmers started, started actually going into the streets and going and covering the demonstrations. And there was the most recent demonstration that happened, which was one of the historic ones, I believe, was the Labor for Palestine demonstration on 12-16. Uh, which was about 4,000 people, but 4,000 organizers, union organizers. And that probably scared the shit out of people, right? Uh, out, of, out of these people. Now, the, the thing about um, the, the, the struggle so far is that we're going to probably, the unions have already given most of the endorsements, the, the leadership of these unions have already, uh, most of them have already endorsed, you know, Biden. Uh, including CWA, the previous president endorsed him at that time. And there we're going to be hit with all of this kind of, uh, you know, conversation about, oh, if you don't if, if you don't vote for Biden, then you're going to be responsible for these, uh, you know, the, the ultimate right wing. Well, you know, in essence, it's true that we're, we're going to be hit with 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 a with a Trump government that has ultra Christian fascist, crystal fascist, as as Chris Hedges has has to find them um, and who have with them them and are full supporters of this same sector of the ultra right wing sector uh, within Israeli politics. Um, but um, at the, but that doesn't mean we need to we need to uh, go towards uh, the Biden, the genocidal Biden administration, because in reality, um, the unions they don't move an inch when there's a president that's a democratic president. They don't do anything. They try to, you know, uh, quiet. They try to oppress rank and file when there's any kind of um, uh, dissent regarding that. Um, and so we, we need to attack the, 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 we need to make it expensive for, for, for them. In other words, uh, the only thing that the U.S., responds to and any of these corporate entities respond to is the costs that is this that this is costing them. Um, exactly. Janet Coburn says they call themselves the protectors, but then the fact that destroyers. That's correct. Um, one of the interesting things of the developments that's happening, for example, that I see interesting is the 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 phenomenon of the Yemen, the Houthis, which is costing a lot of money because of the insurance, um, the, the, the insurance is not paying, is not, the, it's, it's skyrocketing for these shipping lanes for them to go and they have to go around a long way. Um, those issues, how can we as workers make things costly to them? Well, there's really only one way of doing that and that would be with striking or, uh, or and also uh, divesting and making and amping up our divestment and amping up our boycotting. Um, not only as consumers, but as actually within all of the different uh, areas that we belong to, whether it be in our unions, whether it be in our, uh, you know, um, pension, uh, pension committees um, and, and city pensions and, and city governments. And, um, and so I'm going to just keep, I'm going to go, um, and and lobbying is is one thing, but spending an ordinary amount of time trying to lobby Democratic politicians, uh, when we've already seen only eleven people, uh, eleven senators only voted for Bernie Sanders' uh, very weak resolution, which only asked for what was already in the books, the laws, to have them look at the human rights violations. That was already that's already a law in the books, and only eleven voted for them. So. I mean, the this the fight for the lobbying. We did. We had a very good. Um, we had a very good result in San Francisco, but it but it was close by then. I mean, we got an eight to to three vote, but um, we were able to get a supermajority. But even so called progressive people, or who you thought might be progressive, we could tell that they were being um, somehow, you know. Um, affected by the, the Israeli lobby in, in many aspects, the Jewish um, Relations Committee um, 
was very active in trying to dismantle that resolution and and the London Breed put out a very Islamophobic uh, letter and she had even refused to sign that resolution even at, after it had been passed. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. And I, I and a lot of the people, healthcare workers were there and we were we and, and we fought for that resolution to pass. But the important thing is what we do with those resolutions. Um, Hayward just recently passed an even better one, which was a BDS one to divest directly, $1.5 million was, was the divestment. Um, and as long as we keep doing things like that, we, I think we, we, we're, we're good, but we need, to, we need to educate the workers uh, on the actual character of Zionism and what it is, and the level of control over American politics that these ultra right uh, nationalist and Christian nationalist, as well as Jewish nationalist uh, are involved in and and how that hurts all of us workers and and all of the the black and brown communities that this affects as well this whole issue with the border for example is also another thing that's coming up that's i'm going to leave for later but elbit systems is the surveillance system that has the contract with israel in the border in the arizona border and now um there's a whole bunch of uh, there's the right ultra right wing is 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 going to the border to protect the border so-called so this whole this whole thing that's happening there is also something that we have to look into, and we're going to have to really organize and 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 and, and try to get uh, as many people on board. Uh, you know, we have to support the Palestinian uh, trade union movement for BDS, and 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 we have to. Um, I mean, I I I. It's easier said than done. I know, but there's no other way around it. But that but to continue with education and organizing. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that contribution. I did want to offer Frank Hammer uh, an opportunity to speak as retired past president of UAW 909. And actually, his brother was uh, trained at the Histadrut School in Israel when he was working as an operative in Latin America. So welcome, Frank. Well, thank you. And I, I don't know if people's listening energy is still remains, but uh, I'll say a, a few things. Thank you very much. Um, this has been really informative. So I'm going to, what all I'm going to do is, so my brother was a, 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 Favel, a field operative in uh, many countries in Central and Latin America, principally in El Salvador. And I, all I want to bring forward here is that as, uh, as an a field operative, he was receiving training uh, by his students in Israel. And I remember seeing postcards that he sent to my mom you know about that's where he was he was in israel and i had done a little bit of research a while ago uh i'm going to read some excerpts from that research um which i think might be helpful let me just locate it bear with me for one second uh and i will do that here it is okay so just briefly and so and i think what the important thing is here is that israel has been part of the u.s imperialist project of course, not only in South Africa, but in Central America. And I'm, I'll read just a few of the items. In 1960, the History Institute formed the Afro-Asian Institute for Labor Studies in cooperation funded by the CIA through the AFL-CIO. The Institute was designed to train Asian and African students to assume positions of leadership in their native labor movements. The incentive for both the US and the Israeli state labor organizations was to forestall the formation of independent workers organizations in favor of labor organizing that served the building of neo-colonial states in former colonies. Both unions and the states with which they collaborated, therefore, have a shared dislike of self-organized labor as it threatens the ability of each to control organized labor. Therefore, the collaboration of the CIA, AFL-CIO, and Histrodut in undermining self-organized labor in El Salvador and Southern Africa is a reflection of the common interests that they shared with the repressive regime in El Salvador and apartheid regime in South Africa. In the 1960s, AFIELD, the organization that my brother worked for, uh, that was uh, dedicated to foiling the formation of left-wing unions, tried to organize 
a tame network of rural cooperatives, which is what my brother was involved in, uh, in El Salvador. According to one report, the project was budgeted at 1.6 million and had the assistance of Israeli Histadru Labor Federation. So um, one other item, um, in, um, uh, in, in 1986, in the middle of the Civil War, uh, Israel's ambassador in El Salvador said, we will be reinforcing our technical cooperation in the agricultural and community development fields in which we are considered specialists. By that mouthful, this writer wrote, uh, of euphemisms, the ambassador meant that Israel would help El Salvador strip the last shreds of dignity and hope from thousands of civilian victims. They also did, by the way, uh, ghastly similar kind of work in, uh, in Guatemala. And I'll stop there. But the point being that we have to understand that Israel has served the imperial project of the U.S. in the Americas and have, have all that bonds of collaboration. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And, and also, Lapayo Le Le is not just about Israel, Zionism. Uh, it's about the role of the AFL-CIO internationally. It operates in 62 countries. It has a long history all over the world of, of intervening in the working class and the trade union movement to support U.S. multinationals, U.S. economic and military uh, agenda. So it has a long history. Uh, Janet, you're, you're on. Yeah, hi, and thank you for organizing this. This is a great program. Um, and uh, I have a number of questions. Uh, actually, first, I wanted to ask Carol about that, uh, what, what happens when you uh, try to make your motion and then there's the question is called, I, I'm wondering whether Robert's rules is, is followed strictly, which means that when you want to, when somebody wants to end debate, uh, they must be recognized by the chair. One, two, it requires a second, and three, it also requires a two-thirds vote of the body. So mm. I'm wondering whether that, all that happens. Mm. Um, and then I also, uh, wanted to know, I mean, I, I'm assuming Histadrut is existing now. You didn't talk much about what's going, what, what it does now. You talked mostly about the history of it. Um, and I think it's called the uh, General Organization of Workers in Israel, something like that. Um, how much of it, or, you know, the, the funding I mean, is is it really sort of part of the Israel lobby? I mean, like, uh, are, is union leadership in the pockets of the Israel lobby, like the U.S. Uh, governmental officials and politicians are? Um, and I mean, is the funding only from unions, or is it also from the broader Israel lobby? Um, and then I, um, I uh, wondered about the state of the Palestinian labor unions now. I mean, it's like in Gaza, it's just whatever. They're, I don't know what's how work is being done at all with what's going on there, um, uh, but also in, in the West Bank. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, finally, I'm wondering if... Uh, any of you are familiar with Andrew Ross's book called Stone Men, The Palestinians Who Built Israel. I mean, it was like mm. back when uh, the Palestinians had mm. centuries and centuries of experience of working with stone and were experts in that. And uh, the Zionists used them when anyway. So I'll I'll stop there. Okay, uh, Kim. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, get low on my hand. Okay, um, one, I think I really have enjoyed this very much. Um, I think all the presenters did a really good job. Uh, I learned a lot, and what's really exciting to me is that uh, this is stuff, this is new stuff for, for me. 
Um, and that I have long been fighting the AFL-CIO's foreign policy. And, and Frank opened it up and said it was part of the Imperial Project, which it is. And if you have not seen my book, which is, came out in 2010, it's the uh, AFL-CIO's secret war against developing country uh, workers, solidarity or sabotage. And I bring that up because I did not talk about history, Dirk. I did not talk about Israel because I didn't have a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying this, this panel to me um, has, has uh, really brought out a lot. I've learned a lot. I've been studying as well because of, of the crisis in Gaza as well. But like Jeff Shirky's got a book coming out this year on their foreign policy. I'm hoping his stuff on Israel is in there. But I also want to point out with the ruling of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice yesterday. Now, it was limited. They didn't call for ceasefire yet. But they said, we want the Israelis to stop killing, which to me is a very important thing. But the important thing of this is it really, really destroyed Israel's mythology that they're virtuous and they cannot be they cannot be criticized. So here were justice, even an Israeli justice voted uh, against uh, Israel on two of the four issues. So it's a chance to open this up and our timing by sheer luck couldn't have been any better at all. So one of the things that that I'm hoping is that this recording will be put on the, the Lapayo website. And that as soon as he gets out, we should notify everybody on the call. And what I'd like to encourage folks to do is to look at this and to transmit it to your networks of friends all over the country, all over the world about what's going on and ask them to uh, to uh, to send that to their fr their networks. In other words, don't just assume people are going to do it. You got to ask them. We, if you like this, if you think it's worthy, send it out to your friends and ask them to send it out to their friends. We've got to get this news and information and the and the reports, the 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 discussion we've had today, or, or the presentations, I should say, that we had today are stunning, and it's important that we get this out. So I'm hoping that everybody. I appreciate everybody that came on. And and I hope that each of you will work to get this news and information out further in your union, among your friends, throughout the U.S., across the world, whatever. There's a lot of really important information. And uh, I hope we take the opportunity to push as hard as we can on all this stuff. Okay, thank you. I'll stop now. Okay, an answer to the question. I, I, as far as the Histadrut, uh, the Histadrut, Histadrut is a commercial organization. It's not just a, uh, a, a what it calls a trade union for for uh, for Jews. So they get money from the state, and they're integrated in the social security system in Israel. So they're part of the state apparatus in Israel. By the way, they have national health care in Israel, which we don't have in this country, uh, but. Um, so one of the things that's happening now, and there is a crisis uh, in Israel, is that they've expelled the, uh, they've not only expelled, they've beaten uh, the workers up, they've terrorized the uh, Palestinian workers, uh, they've been beaten. Uh, and what, what is happening in Gaza is not just happening in Gaza, it's happening in the West Bank, where there's a pogrom uh, against against people in, the, in Gaza. But there's a uh, one Palestinian or Arab uh, trade union organization which is trying to, get the right of uh, the Palestinian laborers to go back into Israel to work uh, because they have no income. So, but you have a situation of starvation now, mass starvation of millions of people. And it, it seems to me that, um, you know, our fight now is for the survival of the Palestinian people. They will kill millions of people. I mean, the Zionists have no qualms about mass murder, mass genocide, as we've seen here. And I, I think one of the things politically we have to do that is to, to put that around the uh, around these union officials who don't want to fight this, who don't want to mobilize, who don't even want to have a discussion on it. There is going to be a conference on uh, February 25th, Labor for Palestine in the Bay Area, uh, uh, of the people that organized the rally in, in Oakland of 2000, two to 4,000. So that will be another opportunity to get information out about uh, Zionism, its history, and and what the unions, our unions, need to do about it. So uh, I think those are some of the issues. Uh, Carol? 
Yeah, I, I didn't know. I mean, I there was when I proposed the resolution, there was a, a what you call it, um, you know, a call the question, and I'm sure it was second, but I don't know now that I'm thinking back on it because I was so annoyed whether there was actually a two thirds vote. Um, I'm gonna have to check that out next time, but probably there's there's such suck ups. I I just sat in the corner with my sign that said how many you know Palestinians have died, how many of them were children, and all of that because I was so outraged. Um, so thank you for letting me know that, and I'll have to pay attention more, you know, for the next resolution that I'm going to raise. Was um, there a vote at all? I you know I don't. Was there a vote? There may, there may. <laughs> there, there was a vote to move the agenda, and and there, uh, and there the was agenda. a vote to call the question, and then there was it was seconded, and then it seemed like I think that was the end of it, but I don't want to say that for sure. But so, so you I don't know. Uh, pushed your issue further by pressing for what they are supposed to do and uh, um, uh, point of order and all that, just. It right. It 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 would have been just a you know a brawl, but um, because nobody was really supporting me. But 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 I'll have to thank you. I'll have to keep those things in mind for the next resolution I want to raise. Um, <laughs> a, a couple of things just about the the history. I I don't think it even makes any pretense to being you know the the protectors uh, supporters of the working class when when hundreds of thousands of people were on strike and not supporting the Palestinians, but only for, you know, to, to keep the judiciary to the pretense of democracy. The history Jew didn't come out in support of them and, and make a statement about it. Um, and the other thing about Israeli society, it has one of the highest poverty rates in the industrialized world, second to the United States, so that Clearly, the history of Jude is not fighting for higher wages and better conditions for the working class. And in fact, I even get in my mailbox, can I, can I, you know, donate to to the poor Jews in Israel, which is pretty incredible. But you know, so the history of Jude, I don't think even anybody, except for the AFL CIO, has any. <laughs> pretense about the fact that it, this is a some sort of labor union that's defending workers. I, I have a question for Jeff uh, Shirky on, on your uh, research. And have you had any reactions from the AFL-CIO on, on the research you've done in your articles? No, not, di not directly. Uh, you know, I did an article about how the um, Thurston Mason Lewis Labor Central Labor Council in Olympia, Washington, um, in mid October, they passed a ceasefire unanimously passed a ceasefire resolution and a resolution endorsing the call from Palestinian trade unions for unions around the world to not manufacture or ship weapons to Israel. Uh, and after they passed it, the national AFL CIO stepped in and said, you know, as we've heard from from other panelists that. Uh, uh, you know, you can't do that because the same thing that they told the San Francisco Labor Council in 2021, because it goes against the national AFL-CIO's policy that central labor councils can't do this. So I wrote an article about that and I reached out to the national AFL-CIO and asked them to comment and they didn't, they did not respond. And there've been other articles I've written over like in 2021, the last time, the last, you know, major assault on Gaza, um, and I reached out to the AFL-CIO then, and they didn't respond. When, I re when I've reached out to the AFT, to um, Randy Weingarten's spokesperson actually always always responds, which is interesting, and basically just points to Randy Weingarten's tweets or her you know Facebook posts and things because she's always talking about uh, about Israel. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, one thing that is very important to recognize, which is a very positive thing in this work around education, is that there is a mass movement of activists in the unions now, and that, that's changing the dynamics of these things. As has been pointed out, most of the workers who are now involved 
in these healthcare for Palestine and all these different unions are young workers, many of them, and they've never been involved in the unions before. So actually the work we're going to be doing and needs to be done is critical because these workers, many of them have never even been in unions before, much less activists in their unions. So this is a great opportunity for some serious education and bringing together the, the, the information so that they have the knowledge about what's going on and they can take this up in their unions and education meetings and others. So I think that's a, this could be the first of many and it should be. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Oh, uh, Elizabeth? Can I say Please one last me. thing? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think we really also need to make sure that we push within our union leadership our right to speak up uh, and that the unions have a legal obligation to defend us as workers for, for, for speaking up, because that's what we're facing right now. We're facing um, uh, some a lot of backlash um, and people are get afraid because they can lose their jobs. But, you know, we're dealing with a genocide. And so we, we there's going to be lots of activities. There's people, you know, some of us have gone to Travis Air Force Base and got arrested at Travis Air Force Base. There's sit-ins at the UC Regents. There was students that sat there uh, at the UC Regents meeting and got arrested. Um, the Bay Bridge, uh, Carol was mentioning, uh, and other people were mentioning the different demonstrations going on. Um, so there's going to there's gonna be a lot of movement. But um, as of yet, what we also need to stress among all of the activists involved, if you're a member of a union, you need to work within your union and, and come out as a member of your union with your with all your attire. And when you speak with the media, speak as a member of a union as well, because, you know, that's how media tends to keep us, you know, um, invisible, uh, union members invisible. They don't recognize us as that. And, and, and so we need to make sure we we push that forward punctuated something uh yeah. all this great information and i'm i'm truly honored to have uh been privy to it and to be able to consistently learn from all of you but i will say that next part of this uh, has got to be has got to be about organizing and i'm afraid that it is not only it's not just a matter of the unions being our vehicle for organizing but as we learn with the histadrut very often even our so-called most progressive unions or unions like mine where they do have resolutions now the uaw will capitulate in a minute at best and what we have to learn about organizations like APAC and the new form of McCarthyism that would tamp down and create a situation where like in my union and my local where we were sued by our own union members for allegedly create just by virtue of trying to have a resolution, a resolution for a ceasefire just to have a vote on it. And that was considered to be a hostile work environment and so on, which was used to uh, stop it. And they, we wound up in federal court over it. And what happened then is our employer started having captive meetings that were taking away union privileges from us, such as meeting to even discuss union business, because that too was viewed as creating a hostile work environment by which, and I happen to work for the Legal Aid Society, a public interest, the largest public interest organization. So I just want people to know that we, we were also told there is that uh, there was a threat of defunding our organization. The issue of the work of APAC and the Israeli incredible lobby uh, and mobilization of the monies and the economic interest of uh, the U.S. capitalism is just something that has to be part of this discussion. Uh, it's fine to discuss the histadrut, uh, but there is a much broader picture that we have to educate ourselves on and the movement and begin to build in absolutely and unequivocally to our organizing the question of the day after. The day after, which is about fundamentally the issue of self-determination, because a ceasefire, which is imperative, is only part of it. The ethnic cleansing, as I said, and the raising of Gaza to at best permanently create another apartheid situation 
or for U.S. economic interests, which the unions capitulate to by virtue of their relationship, as we all know, to the Democratic Party, is just the second part, Steve, of this discussion, which we really have to take up. And I know every one of you is intimately involved. And while I have some differences on the IJC uh, decision, yes, the Globalizing the Intifada made it possible for it to happen, and the historic relationship of the South African anti-apartheid movement uh, to the Palestinians made it possible for that court case to unfold. Uh, but it is an absolute shanda uh, that this court, on these facts, uh, again, a very conservative and, and, and corrupt judiciary in the final analysis, would not have a finding of genocide and would allow the war to continue the uh, to continue and to allow Israel to come back with uh, a, a, a thinly veiled report in 30 days that says we we are mitigating we are doing surgical strikes against so we've got lots of work to do thank you Steve for putting this together and i also maintain that another vehicle uh, is the so-called labor, liberal labor movement, like labor notes and so on, why this is not a fundamental issue at their conference coming up in April and how we can make it so and begin to collectivize our activity and organizing within the labor movement about Absolutely. where we go from here. Yeah, and we thank could, we... each and every one of you for providing the background to enable us to have a where we go from here.